Well, hello, welcome back to Living Well. And this is episode number two. And tonight I'm going to be joined by the rather wonderful Sarah Ann Macklin. And we're going to be talking about the role of nutrition in Living Well. Hey guys, good to see you. Just adding Sarah now. There she is. Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I love this green theme we've got going on. It's almost oh, like Columbus. It's my little oasis that I've created in my home. <laughs> I mean, I am obsessed. I've got green at the front and the back. It's the reason I bought my place. So anyway, amazing to oh. meet you. Um, it's such a, a, an honor, honestly. I've been tracking your career and boy, have you got a lot packed in. Um, so for those of you who may not know Sarah Ann, she's had an incredible career starting out as a, an amazing model working for big brands like Dolce and Burberry and all those kind of brands. Um, and then you made a big departure, didn't you? After really being very established um, to qualify in nutrition. And I'm just super curious what, if you look back, mm -hmm. was there a moment when you knew I need to, to change the way I'm living? Was it one thing, like a sort of sliding doors moment? Or was it more of a gradual awareness of wanting to do things a little bit differently? No, there was like a massive thud on the ground. It was really? like, this is happening. Yeah, I basically, to put it l not lightly, um, was in hospital for many months in intensive care. Really? So oh my, my body... Yeah, like yeah, so my body had totally shut down on me. Um, so we're going back now 12, 13 years ago. So I'm trying to take everyone who's listening to this, take yourself back then when wellness and well-being and mental health and nutrition wasn't really spoken about. It was kind of coming up, but it wasn't really a thing. It wasn't in England anyway. I know in America it was. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I kind of been following, like, specific guidelines and what I should be doing and all these do's and don'ts of how I should be like eating and you know acting and and it just didn't work for me and it basically gave me really bad habitual burnout um and so I say burnout to an extent of you know I had kidney failure I had sepsis I had like 10 birth cysts like I mean I was like down and out so um it's that's known as habitual burnout when your body literally stops and i think i was under such a high amount of stress from this very glamorous career um that isn't actually as glamorous as we think um and then trying to kind of keep this constant level of perfectionism and everything i was mm. doing what i was eating and i had no idea about the concept of mental health i had no idea of like true nourishment and i had no idea of like self-awareness and I think those three things when put in a very like heightened career at a very young age, um, I didn't know when to stop. So my body stopped for me. Um, and that and that's what happened. So yeah, that was my that was quite kind of my moment when I was like, I think I need to go and sort myself out and understand how I can look after myself. Um, so I, I enrolled in human nutrition, um, a bachelor of science. Um as biochemistry and started there and um that was kind of the change of my career which i remember doing and <laughs> telling everyone what i was about to do and they were like why would you go and do that when you've got <laughs> leave all this yeah <laughs> you know, and i remember I, I had a mortgage i had all these kind of things because i had a certain level of success and it was really daunting to go away i might go and study something totally different and not in it any money for a very long time and also support myself during that process so it's a very like 180 um and i think everyone for about five years thought i was mad and i i doubted why i thought i thought i was mad during it as well because also it wasn't really a, a thing i remember telling my grandmother i'm gonna go and study to be a nutritionist um and biochemist and she was like what is that so you know it wasn't a cool thing to do but yeah i kind of got led right to it thing. and now and everyone knows about it which is great <laughs> And was that because nutrition had played a big part in your recovery and you felt like the, you didn't have easy access to that knowledge, but it was the thing that made a difference for you? Because I guess you could have gone in lots of different directions in terms of fix, fixing, you know, your mind, your body, your spirit. Um, what was nutrition? What was the draw there, do you think? So I think the first draw for me was I was living in New York when it happened and I remember 
being in East Village, living right next to the big Whole Foods, living right next to Soul Cycle, living right next to this like intense Pilates called SLT that was like just would hammer your body. And I think the first thing that I was obsessed about, and also social media was just launching. So this was the year that Instagram had launched, mm-hmm. and everyone was posting pictures of what they were eating, like every single person. And so I think I got drawn into this concept of like food was was to heal you but I, I I kind of got it very wrong because I was listening to the wrong voices online you know I was listening to people that had no expertise had no kind of medical background no medical guidance no ethics it was just very much about like have this raw kale salad and you'll feel great with the green juice mm. I mean it literally made me feel awful so I think my passion was I was very unaware of how important mental health was back then, which is now another pivotal role that I do in my career. So for me, the the big the first thing I could actually grasp was food. I was like, what can I do to help myself? Well, I guess the food is, is one of the main steps. And also, I feel so overwhelmed by information out there that it all seems a bit pseudoscience, which means it's not kind of um, driven by anybody who's qualified. So I had this kind of this real activation in me that I wanted to go and study that so then I could communicate advice online that was also healthy it was ethical 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 and it was um expert driven and that was really important that anyone who felt again completely confused could come to I would say my page I didn't think I was going to set up an Instagram page but could come to me and I could give them the correct information so that's where it started and when I started studying I then got really fascinated in in brain health and neuroscience and a lot of my dissertation then went around that. So I started to realise that these like two separate verticals are very as one. So that's kind of how everything developed. Um, But I do remember when I was studying it, like all of these conversations were quite stigmatised back then. Um, So I remember kind of feeling quite alone. And now it's amazing that it's so much more on the forefront and there's so many more expert voices out there. Um, and people are open to having these conversations, which is which is amazing. Because I saw somebody wrote down there, um, food is medicine. And it, and it is to a degree, like it really is, it plays such a big role. But I think if I had said that 12 years ago, people would have looked at me a bit like I was a bit odd and a bit cuckoo. Um, so now it's amazing that these conversations come so much more to the forefront and people kind of, you know, as much as their skincare, think about, you know, the the words that they're saying to themselves, they think about the foods that they're eating, they're thinking about how they're nourishing themselves, not just from the products they're buying, mm. but to what they're listening to, what they're reading, you know, what they're eating, and all of it plays such a big role. That's really interesting, because I think that's around the same time I took to YouTube, and it was for exactly those same reasons. There was a lot of noise, a lot of people who just acquired a platform didn't even really set themselves out to be experts, but were being treated like experts because they'd acquired a following yeah. in this wild west that was the internet back then without any, well, it wasn't as many credible sources for sure. So um, yeah, wanting to be a voice of reason in a sea of noise. I think that's um, yeah. definitely something I can relate to. Now you talk about your seven pillars of health. And I think it's, I, I love a framework. <laughs> For sort of being structured to things that's where my brain works um maybe just share with the audience those those seven pillars and why each of them you think just is, is so important and how they all kind of fit together yeah so it's i remember kind of going through like the last 10 years that's how long i've kind of been in this game now as qualified and i and obviously setting up the different kind of things that i've done like the podcast the bubble podcast and the BYU collective which is the mental health and my clinic And everything was very separate. Like, you know, there was like the BY Collective, which was mental health. And then you had like my clinic that was nutrition. And then you had the podcast that kind of encompassed all of these conversations. And I was like, why are we looking at health as just like one vertical? Like health is like made up of so many different things. And that's been so important just on my own personal journey. Um, You know, and when I was talking about nutrition, for me, I'd be like, well, if someone slept badly, and that's going to import, impact their hormones as soon as they wake up, which is going to impact their decision on the food that they're going to choose and also how that's metabolized. So wait, that's a really leading factor. And then I was thinking about, you know, something that was really important on my journey was human connection. And I was devoid of kind of true human connection, even though I was in an amazing industry, like I felt still felt very lonely. I was surrounded by amazing people, mm. but I still felt very lonely. And I think we all felt that in the epidemic, even though I hate using the word, but a few years ago in COVID, we all started to realize like the true impact of loneliness. Mm. And so I was like, there's so many different elements to our health, yet we speak about these in like really isolated forms, but they're all so interlinked. 
And I've been really inspired, um, and I'm sure you've watched it, and if not, do, 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 go and watch it, the Dan Buettner on um, Netflix for The Blue Zones, mm. where he looks yeah, at... Like, and then the my mum watch it immediately, is like, you and the family need to, you know, <laughs> so basic, but it's so obvious, you know, it's, it's yeah. Yeah. yeah right and like we need to like have purpose and we need to connect with our community and all of these things are so important yeah um and i think i found that very early on which you know for, for a 23 year old to have like severe habitual burnout is quite rare um but i think it drove a lot of my purpose and it also made me realize how important human connection is and to have like proper deep nourishing relationships not just surround yourself with people that actually have these like real bonds that's really important so when I, when people kind of come to my website or when, you know, they listen to the podcast, for me, it's really important just to, although I'm known as a nutritionist and I speak a lot about mental health, because that's kind of where my, my research has been. For me, I really want people to look at health in a kind of a multifactorial shape where there's so many different things that impact your health. And there's never going to be one time in our life that all of these are going to be perfect. And if it is, that means that you're an AI and you're not human um and so i think what's really important is to like look at these pillars that i talk about and kind of see like where what's missing the most and what should i pay the most attention to um because naturally they're gonna flux throughout our life um and so you've got sleep you've got nutrition you've got self-care which i think is a conversation that has been misinterpreted as bubble baths and spa days and actually self-care to me is like self-respect like it's taking a moment for yourself understanding your importance of connecting back to self-awareness and taking just a little bit of time for you um you might have to remind me of these because i've not got them all up um <laughs> you've got movement you've got human connection um you've got emotional resilience and i yeah. think that is a really important one um we're never talk, talk, taught about how to manage or understand our emotions and we know from research that most people can only basically describe their feelings in three emotions which is like sadness anger and um and happy and so Street basically themes, right <laughs> not necessarily the bits in the middle and, mm. And so kind of navigating our emotions can feel really vulnerable and scary, but also totally unknown because like, no one teaches us that. And mm -hmm. so to have emotional resilience, I think, is really important for health because we're going to have moments when life throws us curveballs or when we're really stressed. But if we don't know how to manage them, voice them, speak them, understand them, be self-aware, then actually all of these other health things kind of just fall, fall apart. So, yeah, so I'd say go and check out the seven pillars. They're all kind of really important um, kind of flags that I, I talk about on the show um but I think they all play together so yeah that's kind of why I made them and um I talk about them a lot mm. and where do you think skin health fits into all of that could that be the eighth pillar maybe oh, oh yeah I know <laughs> it's so hard right I feel like um, I, I feel like I can hand my pillar to you for that one because you're kind of the queen <laughs> you also completely transformed my skin we'll have to get onto that in a minute I don't think you mm. might I don't know if you know the story of this um I heard it's something not, today from someone who was like, okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't know that I'll, had happened, I'll, but okay. I'll, I'll tell you what happened because it's, Amazing. I think about it a lot. Um, but um, the skin health, I think it's, I, it's interesting, right? Skin is our lar largest organ, which people kind of forget that it's an organ, but it's one of the most like physical determining symptoms of our health. So I even remember, you know, I'm on my menstrual cycle right now. I'm feeling a bit gray and my acupuncturist saying to me, well, you look, you know, you look a bit yellow in your skin. And I was like, I feel, I feel really run down, you know, and that, that's for me to, a symptom to say, actually, although I'm feeling it, like when I look at myself, mm. I'm not saying like I look yellow right now, but it's one of those moments to kind of check in with yourself and go, well, actually, how am I feeling? And, you know, skin is one, like, one of our, our kind of most physical symptoms of stress. So a lot of people when they get stressed can get a lot of like skin issues. And so I think we really miss the term in our skin health. Um, but for me, I don't feel strong enough to put it as a pillar just because I don't know enough about it. Um, so I have to refer. So I can only talk about it from feeding your skin from the inside out as opposed to you, which is like the outside in, which is why we'd be quite a good duo. Because I mean, I Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, I, I think thinking of, you know, the gut microbiome and the skin microbiome really as a continuum um, mm -hmm. is, is absolutely the right way to look at it. And I, I think I spend an awful lot of my, my working life really just helping people 
maintain their microbiome and just to allow their skin to do its skin thing you know and actually not to meddle with it too much but um i i love the fact that you can irradiate the skin with ultraviolet and your gut microbiome changes like i think that just says everything about the interconnectedness of uh what is essentially a a tube with an inside and outside um definitely and um, i know when i'm not feeling well my skin erupts or I no, know when it's, I'm it's a billboard right yeah. it's uh it's it, it, you know and because there's so much of it because it's so biologically active I think we have around 23 24,000 genes and there are 15,000 genes active in the skin at any given time mm-hmm. and retinoids affect 3,000 of those like I mean you know there's these figures that show mm-hmm. us that actually maintaining our skin because of the impact of our skin health and actually our, our sort of our longevity and our mm. health span because of the internal mm. impact of mistreating our skin. Like it's it's not Absolutely. vanity, it is self-care, I think. I feel really 100%. passionate about that. A hundred percent. I do really think that we need to be not looking at skin health as vanity because honestly, like I feel very privileged in the fact that I've never, apart from this one time when I literally called your team, Sam, not that I, because I couldn't get to see because you were too busy, but your team really helped me out. It was the only time I've had a bad skin breakout and I am not joking it impacted my confidence way more than I would realize and I think it's one of those things that if we don't just feel good about ourselves and it's not just like how we look you know it's like how how confident do we feel in ourselves and that can be from anything from like body shape to body size to you know I was too thin at one stage and actually people might find that funny but like it really affected me um and it's because I wasn't diagnosed with the correct health condition and I wasn't being able to maintain maintain any weight and I hate it every time I looked in the mirror and so I think anything that affects our confidence is actually a really important indicator as well because then it affects our happiness and how we perform and all of those things Mm. so I think skin is such like an underestimated conversation in that area that some people really struggle with and I struggled with it for six weeks and I really kind of understood actually that's the real difficulties that people have when when they're faced with that day to day, because you are looking at yourself in the mirror day to day, it's quite hard to say something positive if you're not feeling not you're not feeling about that about yourself. So, so yeah. So I I feel like I now connect to that. And I, it's it's quite nice, isn't it? In a way, when you look back to realise that there is that sensitivity there, and that you know, I think it does give you that bit of compassion. I mean, I, I you know, I, I obviously that's I, my word. I, I word. It's so really compassion. That, no, I'm not very good weird. at it. Are you? Are you? Uh, do you, are you someone that struggles with it? Because I did. I hated uh, myself forever. I mean, I'm. I'm. I'm writing about it now, um, and I, and it's something where a lot of my work for the last two years has gone into it. So you're seeing a lot mm. more that's coming out on my end. But I, I hated myself for most of my life. One, because I was. Um, an undiagnosed dyslexic, so I went through school thinking I was sick my entire life, and I'm not smart and useless. And then the second thing was, oh, look, someone's giving me a thumbs up. No, Bob, um, I've never seen that before. <laughs> I have I've seen that on Zoom. I've never seen that on, on Instagram. Um, oh, and then oh. the second thing is like modeling, obviously, the comparison you know, whole day, in, day thing, out. I mean, yeah. How bad you look. Look, and now I say modeling is now no different to someone's everyday life of opening up Instagram because you're constantly compared to things that aren't real and filters that are on there. So I actually say like now everyone basically lives what I lived 12 years ago, um, which is the constant comparison. So those two things, I totally devoid myself of any type of self-love, self-compassion, kindness. You know, I was always beating myself up. And so basically, I do believe that was one of the things that sent me um, into complete burnout because I just couldn't understand how to be kind to myself. I would never treat myself like I would a friend. I'd never give myself any self-respect. Like I didn't think I was worthy. And I think it's such a big conversation that so many of us are probably unaware of that we don't treat ourselves that we're worthy or like we would a best friend. But we we find it much easier to be compassionate to others Mm -hmm. than we do to be compassionate to ourselves. And because we probably feel like you know it's a bit of a narcissistic thing to do but it's not because actually when you're kind to yourself you can find your daughters yeah you can admit more kindness yeah i know it's really huge so now no i don't struggle with it i i still have to like maintain it and tell myself like how would i treat a friend if they came to me with this question or what would i cook a friend for dinner that's what i'm going to do for myself tonight I Um, i like that i might borrow that that's a nice one 
Yeah, mm. right. Because I always say, how often do you go and cook something really nice for yourself? And what, and what would you cook for yourself <laughs> in that particular mindset where you need a bit of TLC? What, what is the... So, I mean, I could talk and be like, and this is what I prepared. No, I've got an absolute <laughs> frosting. That would be um, too good. That might look like we might have set this up. So, <laughs> I mean, I could literally show you what I'm defrosting because it's on, I want to see you truthfully. Um, yeah. Some really delicious salmon fillets. Uh -huh. that I've done I'm gonna have like chili and ginger um and put all of this herbs and spices on it and yeah. grill some delicious broccoli and roast some sweet potatoes um yum, yum. and just have like a really like warming anti-inflammatory that time of the month meal and that's what I would cook for a friend if they came around some like really delicious salmon um with kind of some nice toppings on so yeah so I kind of think like but how often we do that I would have probably before just made some hummus on some bread or something and like you know what you i mean throw something bad exactly <laughs> yeah and do you have cheat days or do you or are you always like pretty much put in your body what you think it needs rather than what your brain needs or wants do you know what i never would say i would never use that terminology because i think that basically makes us feel that we're guilty. we're bad mm -hmm. we're guilty or we're also um I'm very, I'm a big believer on mindset. So I believe that our mind and body are one unit and everything we tell ourselves is how our body responds. So if I'm telling myself, oh, I'm now going to be bad and have this cheat day, it basically makes me feel that like I'm not starving myself, but I'm restricting myself all through that week because I like really want to have everything I want on that one day. And I actually think that can turn into a really unhealthy mechanism where we're mm. like, gosh, now I've got to strive to eat really well. Whereas for me, like eating well is a sense of joy. So if I, I mean, I had a massive bag of buttons last night because I was like, oh, I really feel like I need something that's like delicious and chocolatey and that. Oh, you know. and you've got PMT. I mean, everything. You and know. I just really wanted <laughs> it. But I'd never look at myself this morning and go, oh, I was really bad last night. I go, oh my God, I really enjoyed that. That was epic. Good. And then like today I was like, I really know I want some delicious salmon because that's going to make my tummy feel so much better and my mind. So I try and look at it like that rather than um, than cheat days. Because I think yeah. that, that tells me that I have to restrict myself, which I don't think is a very good conversation. For sure. Now, we had some questions. If yes. I can, like, shoot some rapid-fire questions at you. Um, now, these are, what's your top diet you change tip for healthy skin? So, yeah, I, I would love to be able to give my busy um, patients coming into the clinic. I, I do generally give them some, you know, global advice, whether it's, you know, we're talking about things about supporting the aging process or acne or whatever it might be. Yeah. But if you were trying to help someone who is busy, mm -hmm. like stock their cupboard so that they don't, you know, have that moment of weakness and maybe sort of, I don't know, Brown. defrost something that's chocolate frozen. Button. Well, you know what I'm saying. Like, yeah. So they can get into sort of maybe the habits that just stocking the right thing so they can throw that quick dinner together. What, do you, what hacks do you find really help people stick mm. better at, you know, supporting a diet that is, you know, full of veggies, et cetera, et cetera? What... Nourishing. Yeah. So I would say it's like anything, right? And I, everyone wants like really quick hacks. And I kind of say like, when you think about exercise, is it a quick hack? No, you've basically got to go on on a Monday and go, I'm going to do yoga on Tuesday. I'm going to go for a run at that time. I'm going to do this at this time. And I think that's what's really important is like nutrition is, is exactly the same. So I always try and say like, look at your week and see when am I at home eating? Can I order a shop online or can I go to the shops on a weekend? So I know that I've got stuff into the freezer into the fridge into the pantry or into the cupboard yeah. for in london like me so you've already got things lined up because i think the biggest problem that i see people trying to stick to a healthy diet is they go six o'clock what am i going to eat and then they like, try <laughs> yeah. it and, the and same voice has got half the ingredients of the recipe you're trying to put together in one more shop isn't doable so then you're like exactly oh, now what so i was trying to say like First of all, like you look at your week and if you're any person like me, he loves looking at a Sunday evening and thinking about your work week, just think about your food at the same time and your exercise. So they're probably, the, 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 that's the main thing to start. Um, the next thing I would say is stock up on lots of things like chickpeas, butter beans, anything that's a legume Another because beans. they're so delicious, yeah. first of all, and you can like roast them, you can chop them in a salad, you haven't got to cook them, they're so versatile and they're cheap and they stick in your cupboard. But they are packed with fibre, which is really important for the gut microbiome, which we've just touched upon. Mm. Um, and they're also a really great way to increase the diversity in your diet. So you can just grab loads and chuck it in with other plants. And it's a good form of protein at the same time. So if you're a veggie or vegan, 
um, it's a really fantastic one. So that's one that I would say definitely add in. And when you're doing it, my other tip is make sure that just get some delicious spices like cumin, smoked paprika, because all of these have bioactive compounds that also really help encourage um, your good gut microbes. And they're also counting as one over five a day. So when you're kind of roasting them, which I love, um, mm. I basically put some chickpeas in, I put some smoked paprika, some cumin, put any kind of herbs and spices that you like, because that actually does go towards one over five a day, chuck loads on and then put it in there for like 20 minutes to roast and you get this like delicious crunch and you can chuck them in salads, stews on top of soups. So that's a really great kind of quick one and it's cheap and it's convenient and you can stock it up um my next one would be salmon which is what i just spoke about because again it's like it's very anti-inflammatory because it's so high in omega-6 um and you can buy some delicious fresh salmon you can put it in the freezer like me and just take it out in the morning so you know you've got that in the evening um but it's like probably one of my favorite like superhero foods that i talk about a lot um and it's really, really good for just so many, so many fantastic reasons mm. of omega-3. Um, and then I would just say, like, I would try and say, if you can't, if you don't know if, what your diary is, because you're busy like you and busy like me, buying frozen veggies isn't a bad thing. Um, and people might go, mm. oh, well, actually, I don't think they're as good as fresh. Most of the time, they're better than fresh, unless you're walking into your garden and picking up some asparagus. <laughs> It's probably going to have yeah. more nutritional value in that frozen veggie than it is going to be in the fresh veggie because most of us aren't shopping locally. Most of us are going to our supermarket where it's travelled five days to get to the supermarket shelves. And by that point, it loses its nutritional value a huge amount. Mm. So I always say if you're making a stir fry, a soup, a stew, or chucking anything in where it's warm, where it can just defrost, having any type of frozen veggie will really lock in that nutritional content. So once you've harvested it, it basically gets frozen that same day so it's cheaper it's quick if you're like a super busy person where you're like oh i don't know if i'm going to buy this veg and it's going to go off but it also holds so much more nutritional value and then plus you're getting more of your plant points as well in there as well so we really want to be thinking about um as much fiber in our diet as yeah. possible with water may i add if you don't have loads of fiber don't have it all in one go because you will get really bad tummy ache so increase it but trying to have um at least of those five to seven different coloured plant-based foods in your diet every day is really important. So beans, frozen veggies, herbs and spices, and omega-3 would probably be from fatty fish, would probably be my my four top key tips for someone who's busy. Love all of those things. Um and do quite a lot of them. I do love beans. I you know the um the, the, the queen beans, what the what the, the ones in the jars, you know the they do the most delicious butter beans. Oh. The bean queen? Oh, no. I don't know. You know what not, I mean? I mean it's... Not the ones that are on dragon Den. yes 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 that oh one. yeah they're amazing they're so delicious yeah. and you, i mean you know you can forget needing yeah fish steak whatever i just find that yeah. they're so they feel quite sumptuous yeah. you know as, be, as exactly. beans go um, so good. okay so that's, those are some really awesome tips and then supplementation it's such mm. a minefield right yeah. i mean i i went into um erwan when i was in la recently and i mean <laughs> your head spins right it's, yeah it's daunting it's 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 hard to decipher what you really need what's you know what's what's nice to have but not essential do you think people should be doing blood tests and getting proper guidance before they go on supplements i mean should we make this as scientific as possible what's your stance on all that so it's twofold i would say having a blood test and just knowing where your biomarkers are mm. is not a bad thing as long as you're getting a proper blood test and you're not doing a hair sample where someone's telling you you're intolerant to a food do not listen to that it doesn't it's not ethically correct it's con stay away from it yep. you're getting a proper blood sample to test your biomarkers fantastic you can then actually see like if you're on the borderline do what could i top it up naturally via foods but it's also fantastic because it can give you different results such as you can know if you're low in iron which again actually if you're iron deficient or anemic which is really serious we really do need to be supplementing because mm -hmm. there's a reason on why you're so low so yes you could be needing to consume more iron rich foods but if you're a vegetarian and you're iron deficient that could be very very difficult um so having again some iron supplementation will be really helpful again looking at vitamin d levels that's something that i don't believe we need to be testing but we definitely can it's a public health recommendation that we should all be supplementing now with so 10 micrograms on vitamin d yes. that was interesting to me so i as somebody who advocates sunscreen all year round you know that's just yes. my view of the prism yep. right i know that the sunscreen 
daily habit thing is hotly debated on the internet right now, but my stance will and probably always will be, you know, daily is better. Let's not even question whether we need it or not. You need to get people into easy to action habits and yeah, so on and so forth. So as a consequence, I do keep an eye on my vitamin D levels because at the end of the day, none of us are making vitamin D with, you know, UVB in winter no. and therefore we need to supplement there. So why wouldn't we do it all year round? That's my, you know, my viewpoint. But I was taking a spray and had been reliably for a couple of years. And when I did check my levels, they were on the low end of normal. Mm -hmm. And it was just curious to me. So I switched to oral tablets and repeated the test. I just wonder how many people are either malabsorbing it or, you know, it, there's such a um, wide array of advice around, depending on who, what yeah. medical body you're coming from as to what the right dosing is for somebody who's otherwise healthy and not at risk mm -hmm. of bone disease or whatever. So I do what, think it's a bit murky, the whole how to approach vitamin D supplementation. What? happened when you switched yeah you did then your I, vitamin d I yeah i mean and i was always taking it with fat as well so i mean i don't think that that was that was the issue because mm -hmm. i generally would take it in the morning and i'd either eat peanut butter or avocado or nuts or something mm -hmm. some form of good fat so yeah just, happen, that so is interesting. it is really interesting i mean there's and, and i think what's really fascinating as well is there's so many different types of vitamin d and you can be having vitamin d with vitamin k2 <laughs> Um, which is also really important for the absorption because K2 is basically like the signaling molecule that helps basically direct where the vitamin D should go. So again, you get so many different types of vitamin D um, and plus if you're having it with certain other cofactors and minerals um, that also can really help increase absorption. So I'd say like, again, if you're feeling like you're unsure, like you get a blood test is really important, but the, the public health recommendation is 10 micrograms or 10 international units. Um, which is, but you'll see like one zero zero zero. So it's like 1000 international units or 10 micrograms is how the public health recommendation would be. Mm. Um, but they can go all the way up to kind of prescription base of like 20,000 um, on the dosages, which you take like once every 10 days. Mm. Um, so mm. I would say it really depends if you're kind of white Caucasian, you'll be at less of a risk of vitamin, vitamin deficiency. If you're more of an ethnic minority, your skin is naturally mm. darker. So you're going to be stopping um that kind of hormone conversion from the sun anyway but what i would say is if you're somebody who if we're someone like 90 percent of us stay indoors 90 percent of the time that's actually a stat which is terrifying which is not only kind of reducing our vitamin d levels but also when we're going out we're wearing sunglasses so again we're not even getting it through our retina to make that conversion mm. it's not just through our skin um and we're not going out for long enough and if it, you know, in English, we're not how it is today, right? <laughs> we, we're not sleeping because our, our circadian, our circadian rhythms are completely yeah. confused. Mm. Um, and then if you're looking at the British summer, which currently is Catastrophe. like overcast, <laughs> like, we're not even topping up our liver, liver, you know, our liver levels. So that's probably why you've also got low vitamin D because you like live in the UK and we're not getting a healthy dose of sunshine as if we're living in Italy, which we're kind of getting all the way through the year or good, at least a good yeah. dose in the summer. So I would say like, if you are of an ethnic minority, you probably will be needing a higher dose. And it actually is really important to go and get your blood levels checked from your GP and you can get it done for free. Um, if you're worried and then your GP will be able to actually see where your blood level is and give you the correct prescription for a vitamin D. But it's so important. I mean, we have a vitamin D receptor on every single cell. Like it's so important to make sure you're checking. And also I know there is, I hate to use, I can't believe I've said this twice. I've not spoke about COVID in ages, but I just say because my dad's just got it. Um, and my first thing, we're going through another, right? another yeah. bout. So I just said to him on the phone, I said, vitamin D has been shown to be really helpful um, with the respiratory conditions. So make sure you're like taking a vitamin D supplement while you're, while you've got COVID. So it is really important. So I would say like, it's kind of a very key key i say vitamin but it's key hormone um to be in check with so so yeah that's yeah. helpful it was very helpful as i say i i i, I learned something myself um through that whole process so it's mm -hmm. just it's you know it's and it's great isn't it when you as a, an individual can share your you know experiences with with your patients mm -hmm. as well and i'm sure you have that kind of close connection with with your clientele as well um i feel like there's we've barely scratched the surface here and our, our time <laughs> is officially up um was there any question that you saw sarah and that you wanted to like address that i i um i feel like the whole dairy and acne thing was was one of the questions that came up and i don't know whether maybe we could just do a little one or two lines on that if you Definitely. do you, i mean do you see many was, people coming to you for nutritional advice specifically around their skin health and say acne 
Yeah, I think I see I see so many different people for such a range of things. I mean, mm. there was quite a few different. I mean, I do see a lot of people coming in worried that um, dairy is affecting their skin, whether it's for psoriasis or whatever skin condition that they're struggling with. And I would say, like, yes, there is a link with too much dairy sometimes. If you're if you're one, you could be lactose intolerant. But two, it's not always the only thing. And I do get worried that people think that it's automatically dairy because there is some research to support that, you know, you could have a lactose intolerance and that could be affecting your skin or there could be multiple reasons of why dairy could be um, causing an inflammatory process on the skin. But I would say it's not the only reason. And my biggest fear, um, because it's very hard to say as a generalised conversation, because I think it's so individual and that's like the most important thing is that people start cutting it out. And actually what they start putting themselves as is a, is a risk of nutritional deficiencies. So mm. again, they could then be very low in calcium, which could be affecting their vitamin D uptake. And so for me, I really like to kind of look into that individual's diet, where they are, where their stress is, as well as everything else that's going on. Um, their gut microbiome is so important um, in giving that kind of a full overlook. But I would say, you know, like stopping it for five to seven days isn't going to cause a nutritional deficiency and if you feel like it's clearing up or you feel like it's better then that could be like an indicator that it could be obviously you know a problem Mm -hmm. but i would then say like actually book in to see a nutritionist because what you want to be doing is not cutting too much out of your diet without kind of putting something else back in um and also it could be other factors like it could be your gut microbiome it could be that actually you're really stressed and that's actually what's causing these flaps there could be an inflammatory process that's happening that you're unaware of So I would say that, yes, there is a link there, but that doesn't mean that that's what's causing it. So, again, it's um, it's super individual. And I'm always a bit worried about saying like, yes, this can cause an effect um, and it, you know, giving the wrong information because it might not be at all. So. um, So, yeah, so I'd say if it is a problem, definitely book in to see kind of a dietitian or nutritionist and um, they can very quickly have a look and see what they think could be the problem but one i did see that i want to basically definitely talk about was what's the best omega-3 for veggies or vegans and i think it's such an important topic of conversation because if you are a veggie or a um a vegan it will be important for you to supplement with an algae based supplement um and i recommend manami which are fantastic yes for i that recommend that supplement. brand as well yeah yeah they're brilliant because they they do so much sustainability around it as well um which i think is really important and they're 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 basically 90 percent of their supplement is filled of that oil as opposed to bulking agents which a lot of supplements can do Mm -hmm. um but the reason why it's really important is you can only get the longer chains and i know lots of people go oh you can get it from flax seeds and walnuts and all these things but the longer chain omega-3s epa and dha from fatty fish and although these shorter chains can go down to the longer chains the translation level is so small and it basically fights with the omega-6 compound as well because they use the same enzyme and because our diets are so high in omega-6 it's like 19 to 1 the conversion rate doesn't really work so you can be eating as many walnuts and chai seeds as you want but it's so such a small conversion because of this high dose of omega-6 we've got on our diet that it's actually really important to take um a, a, ve- a veg- veggie supplement or a, um, a vegan supplement of algae um because it's the main it's one of our main kind of compounds in our cell membrane so it's really important so um i wanted to make sure that i highlighted that because i think it's as important for b12 um for a vegan to take mm-hmm. That's a great piece of advice, actually. And um, I hadn't thought about because I think they do fish oils as well, right? Not just yeah. algae based. Yeah. Yeah. So, so normally people would think about omega 3 with fatty fish. So most yeah. people will take a fatty fish supplement. But obviously, if we're a vegan, that's obviously not suitable for them. So looking at an algae based supplement is great. Okay. I will take that one away for <laughs> sure. And then just to close, um, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Oh. <sighs> my gosh the best piece of advice i've ever been given gosh um on the spot what is the best piece of advice um i would say the best piece of advice i've ever been given i feel like i've been given a lot of advice recently you must have right i mean the the caliber of people on your podcast is top notch i have to say i fell down a rabbit (laughs) hole of dr james Dark matter, dude. Can't remember his name. Yeah, he's amazing. I mean, I'm just fast. I've had some gut issues myself recently, and I'm, I'm. It's really weird how you can be like a patient, and then it's like I, I'm a doctor. I should be dealing with this in a more medical way, as opposed to like that's not my area anymore. So I've gotten a lot more um, 
yeah yeah <laughs> quite interesting I know. autonomous it's... in my attempts at sorting it out basically yeah um, i probably need to have a coffee with you <laughs> yeah i'm good for that you need to have a coffee with me we can we can talk about skin health this is and, really and the reason health. for inviting you on here no, i'm kidding <laughs> i mean i'm dying to see you anyway my skin's all out but you can still give me some i would tips. love to um, let's uh swap skills for sure <laughs> the best thing that i would say i'm probably gonna say it's backward but i think from going through the biggest struggles um comes your biggest learnings and opportunities for sure and i think it's so hard to remember that when you're going through anything that's really hard <laughs> particularly when they come along like, like buses you find that the, the terrible stuff comes man, along threes I, or fours yeah this has been my last few months and i'm just like this can't keep happening and rather than seeing a victim approach which can always happen when we're in that right when we're like struggling and we're like yeah. barely keeping our head above water because everything just seems to be like you know in one part of your surface. life mm -hmm. feeling like it's hard but actually it is like you never learn your biggest lessons unless you go through that mm -hmm. and actually that is when the be the best change comes um and to not fear the unknown and the change because actually that's kind of when the greatest things happen and if i look back to me being 23 and having burnout in hospital and feeling like can i change my career like i'm gonna be a mature student going back to uni and like i hated school because i was dyslexic not that i knew like all of these things where it was like terrifying yes, and i felt so lost in the barriers, dark right i mean like it completely changed my life and actually and now i say it's like the best thing that ever happened to me so i try and remember that a lot like when i'm going through anything that's like a hardship that actually you think your best opportunities are going to come from this um and remembering that i think is really key in those moments I like that. that but yeah, we can I definitely compare stories on this topic <laughs> for another yeah. time. Um, listen, it's been an absolute pleasure. We could have gone on much longer, but I don't want to keep you back on a you promised half an hour. Um, but yeah, let's um, let's stay in touch. This is really wonderful. I do love that. I love that, and thank you for your products for sorting my skin out. It's honestly, <laughs> I have to say it before I go. Basically, I put too much retinol retinoid on my skin. That was a prescription yeah. because I had yeah. conidomes, conidomes. I mean, I've watched yeah. all the yeah. from mm -hmm. this. Um, and yes, and I was putting all this on and then I went skiing and my whole face mm. had just come red and flaked. And I Your never, bear, ever bear was down. <laughs> it completely. And I was using CeraVe first because I just didn't know what to do. I, I mean, I was trying to put anything on my face and it was burning it was just completely burning and then i called um messaged somebody who i didn't realize was working for you nicola and she was amazing she was like you need dr sounds products and honestly within like a couple of weeks everything just went and died down and i realized from your like tutorials on youtube and everything you say like less is more and i think because i get sent some lovely stuff um, to try, I'm always slapping everything on and I'm like, oh, this is anti-aging. Oh, this is this. Oh, this is that. <laughs> and I have no idea. And I think my skin just had a massive freak out, had condoms yeah. everywhere. And then I was trying to like get rid of them. I actually, what I just needed to do was just stop everything and take it back to basics. Um, so yeah, so now I'm back, <laughs> now I'm back. But um, I just think it's such a big lesson with skin health that there's so much out there, but we always kind of think more is better especially if we're like trying to keep our youth radiant skin yeah as we get a bit no i mean and, and particularly i mean I, I see beauty journalists so often for the problems of excess and you know overexposure yeah. and just having access to everything so um yeah moderation like the stoic said right it's key so, <laughs> even actually, in skincare it's the most like <laughs> like mundane turn isn't it but it's like the most powerful thing to remember like balance is key and moderation is key with just everything For sure all right you. well i'm gonna let you enjoy your salmon now um it sounds absolutely delicious i'm gonna have to go to the supermarket immediately um but thank you again for your time and thank you all for joining us and making this a really interesting chat yeah yes. all right Good have evening. a nice day. take care bye Thanks bye now having me bye bye, -bye.